morning. I'd like you to turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We've been talking these last few weeks, preaching these last few weeks, about the kingdom, about life in the kingdom. And uh, we had said in, that the kingdom of God is on the inside of us as believers. Christians, the body of Christ. We manifest the kingdom of God to the world. There are those who want to make the kingdom of God a, a government. They want to make it a, uh, you know, a dominion or whatever. Uh, but the kingdom of God will not literally be manifested on this earth until the king comes back. A kingdom got to have a king, right? Well, our king right now is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's not here. He'll be here. He's coming back. I sure hope he comes back soon. <laughs> I wish he'd come back soon. But, you know, that's, that's up to him. Only the Father knows that. But in the meantime, we're living kingdom lives, or attempting to live kingdom lives, in the middle of a, of a Christless culture. And in, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives us a number of parables. Now, Jesus taught a lot with parables. We know what parables are. They're stories that uh, deal with everyday things that demonstrate spiritual reality. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gave us a number of parables, or seven parables in this chapter, and they deal with the kingdom. They deal with the kingdom of God on earth until Jesus comes back, the time we're living in right now called the church age. Church age. Uh, he gave these parables and... and in these parables, we see some, some similarities, uh, like a, a, a train of thought throughout these parables. Some of them are very familiar to you. Some of them you have heard, preached on, and there's some really good preaching on some of them. And some of the interpretations of some of these parables are not good. Okay? We're going to try to give you what we feel is the right interpretation of the parables. In chapter 13... It says, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things unto them in parables. In these parables, we're going to see Christ teaching about the prevalence of good and evil during the church age. How many people know there's good and there's evil in the church? Now, now, there's always evil out there, you know. But we're talking about in the body, in the church. There's good and there's evil. In, in what some people call Christendom, you know, for 2,000 years, there's been a presence on this earth called the church. It's taken various forms and, and it's looked different ways. Uh, there have been, and, and I, I want to tell you this, there are really, there, there's really two, two kingdoms. There's a visible kingdom and there's an invisible kingdom. The visible kingdom, you look and you see church buildings and you see the influence of the body of Christ for the last 2,000 years on this planet. That's, uh, you know, we see big church buildings and, and we can read history. We can read that people went forth conquering in the name of Jesus with shields and swords with crosses on them. And, and they went, you know, trying to make converts. They didn't want to make converts. They want to make slaves and call them Christians. That's what they did. And, and they did that in the name of Jesus. That was evil in the name of Christ. The external, that was ex externally evil. But for 2,000 years there's always been a remnant, there's always been a body of believers that have gone forth with the love of Jesus, is preaching the gospel, making disciples, as Jesus told them to do. That's been going on for 2,000 years too. They've been going on together. So we know that there's good and evil in the church. We know that there is apostasy and worldliness in the church. Man, there's apostasy and worldliness in the church. I believe that we're seeing such a great wave of apostasy and worldliness under, under, under the guise of Christian or under the cross or under things called the church. We're being overwhelmed almost by worldliness in the church. And it's tempting and sometimes it's, it's hard to resist the temptation to go the way of the world because the way of the world can bring results. We see that in the church. 
we see that Christ wants to alert His disciples to expect the evil within the kingdom and to teach us how to overcome the evil in the kingdom. He wants us to be overcomers. He does, doesn't want us to be taken by surprise. He wants us to know that these things are coming. He told His disciples in another place, He said, listen, I'm telling you th these things. I don't want to try to scare you. I want to arm you with information so that you can be prepared. So that you can be ready. He spoke these parables. And the first parable is one that's very, very familiar. The parable of the sower. Let's read a little bit. Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell under good ground and brought forth, 60, uh, uh, brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came unto him and said, Jesus, why are you speaking to us in parables? Why don't you just tell us what the story is here? Listen to what he said. He said it's because, in verse 11, it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but not to them it is not given. You and them. Us and them. How many people know us and them? <laughs> You've got to be careful when you start doing us and them. Okay. You've got to be careful. Because if you start doing us and them too much, you start to think that, like, you know, we're, there's us and we circle the wagons and we... But there's a us and there's a them. He's talking to his disciples. He says there's a difference between you and between them. You see, he just gave this parable amongst a lot of people. There was a lot of people listening, but not everybody was hearing. I have found out there's a lot of people that listen, but they don't hear. But they hear, but they don't listen. Depends how you put it. You know, they hear the sound waves of a person's voice. They heard the sound waves of Jesus' voice, voice in the words he was speaking going forth. They heard, and it, and it, it made an effect, but they, didn't, but they didn't listen. But they didn't listen. He says, It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. There's some people who will live their whole lives and never fully understand about God and His ways because they don't want to. Jesus didn't make this stuff so difficult that you need a college degree to understand it. He really made it very, very simple. Parables are about simplicity. He says in verse 12, For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever has not, from him shall be taken. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross. Listen, we're living in a, in a, in a society, in a civilization, where people's hearts are hardened. They're, they're, they're covered over with deceitfulness in the things of the world. They're covered over, they're hardened. People have built brick walls around themselves. In their hearts. Just like in Jesus' day. He was speaking to people who were religious, who read and understood the law and the word and all those things, yet when He came to speak, He was speaking the word of God. They should have recognized it was God's word. But instead... They chose to reject His Word. See, we need to be careful. We've got to be sure that we really want to hear what God is saying. Not necessarily hear what I'm saying. As long as I'm saying what God's saying. Okay. If I give you my opinion, you can either accept or reject it, and that's all right with me. It doesn't matter. But if I'm saying what God's Word is saying, then it's not me speaking, it's God speaking. He's saying... 
For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes ha- they have closed, lest at any times they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your ears, for they see, and your, uh, your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. If you want to hear what God is saying, then you'll hear. If you don't really care, you can shrug it off. You can come to church or go to a church on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. And you can hear the preacher preach. And you can, you know, you can hear the music. And you can hear and, and just walk out and, and say, okay, I was at church today and, and go off and do your thing. But if you're not going to allow the Word to do something in your life, you're really just, it's just kind of going one ear and out the other. Do you ever feel like your words are going in somebody's one, in one ear and out the other? <laughs> if, you ever, if you ever had kids, I know you feel like that sometimes. If not, you will. Okay. Verse 17. For verily I say unto you, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. We're so blessed as people living in 2011 in the United States of America. We're so blessed to be living in a place where we can gather in a room like this and read and study and talk about God's Word freely. There's places in the world they have to hide to do that. I was talking to my friend. How many people remember uh, Mike? China Mike. Remember China Mike? I'm hoping I can get here. He was a fellow. He, he's a, he teaches English in China. He, he's very fluent in Chinese. And, and he, he comes home every once in a while and visits and he goes back to China. He works in a university there. He was actually beaten in China. Yeah, there was, the last time he was here, some of you, how many you remember? He was here on a Sunday night. And he shared his testimony where he went to a, to a meeting and they hit him with a pipe. Um, you know, the, the police came and hit him with a pipe. He got beat up. And... Uh, and he's back home. I'm trying to get him. I, I, I think he's home until February sometime. But, but there are places in the world where they've got to go underground. They've got to hide. Man, we're blessed. We're blessed. Now, we're blessed that we have God's Word. We're, we're blessed that we know the truth. The prophets and, and the righteous men that were before Christ, they could only look forward to what was promised in God's Word. Verse 18. Hear ye the parable of the sower. We've, we've, we've heard this so many times. We've heard it preached, expounded upon. And it's a good one. The reason why I hear it so many times is because it's so pertinent. What are we supposed to be doing on this planet as we're occupying space here until Jesus comes back? What are we supposed to be doing? Spreading, what did he tell his disciples? Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Teach them to obey all things that I've taught you. That's our primary purpose. We lose, we lose that. Some folks think, you know, some folks think it's, it's a, when you get into like a preacher position, you think your primary purpose is to stand up and preach on a Sunday morning. That's my, you know, my job. That's what I do. But that's not my primary purpose. My prim- primary purpose is to facilitate going out, bringing the gospel to the lost. Doing it myself and trying to facilitate others to do likewise. The kingdom of God on this earth is not about having church. It's about spreading God's word. Jesus gives his interpretation of the parable of this. He says, when anyone hears the word of God, verse 19, and understands it not, doesn't understand it, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Now, if you remember the parable, Jesus said that a sower went forth to sow, and some of the seed fell on, fell on the hardened ground. In those days, they didn't have machinery and, and I'm not a farmer, and I'm not, I'm not agrarian in nature. The people in Jesus' day, they were all, you know, they knew about farming, and they knew about growing things. And uh, they didn't have machines. If you ever 
saw on a farm these big machines that plow and sow and do all these things. They didn't have that. What they would do is they would walk along the path that somebody would go forth and, and dig the ground up and somebody would walk along the path and put seeds in the ground. And there were paths in between the furrows that from walking on them, you know, if you walk on something on dirt long enough, it gets hardened. So there was, there was, there was a place there that was tramped down. And some of the seed would fall on that. And, you know, if you just put a seed on top of, on top of the ground, what happens? Uh, if you ever planted grass in your front yard, you know you'll get about 3,000 birds that will come along and just eat that seed up before you can blink an eyelid. So the first example that Jesus gives us, and there are many of us who have experienced this personally and with others, when you try to, when you try to share God's word, how many people actively try to share God's word with, with other people? You go out and you really, and it doesn't mean you have to stand on the corner and preach to them. There's some folks that they hear God's word and they don't understand. They're not sure, you know, they, they, don't, they don't grasp it. And thank God for there are those who, they'll come and they'll ask. I always tell people there's no such thing as a stupid question. If you have a question, if there's something you don't understand, then, then ask. But there are some that they hear God's word and they don't really understand. And I think the reason why they don't really understand is because a lot of people don't want to understand. And it bounces off, just like the hard ground, and the, and the birds come. You know, people have been trampled on for so long sometimes that they're so hardened that they really don't care. We encounter that. It's been going on for 2,000 years. There are some people whose hearts are so hard that they hear the Word of God, and it just sits there. And the birds come along, and we know what birds represent. They represent Satan. Do you know, when, when you share the word with somebody, do you know that there's a devil right behind you? But you got to listen. If you're actively sharing God's word with people, I guarantee you that right on your tail is a devil waiting, just waiting for you to turn around the corner, and they'll jump on that person, and they'll try to grab that word out of their spirit just as quick as you can blink an eye. You remember that uh, in Acts, I think it's chapter 19, when Paul and Silas, they were in the city of Philippi. And every day they would go to the place of prayer, city of Philippi. And there was a demon-possessed girl. You read about it in Acts chapter 19. A demon-possessed girl that would follow them. And they would say, here are preachers of the Most High God, or servants of the Most High God. I don't remember the exact words. She would, she would like, endorse them. These are, these are uh, servants of the Most High God. Hear what they have to say. And you might think Paul would say, hey, this is cool. I got the devil saying I'm all right. No. No, see, I don't want the devil on my side. Do you hear me? I don't want Satan on my side. I don't want him backing me up. Because I guarantee you, if he's backing you up, he got a knife ready to stick in your back. <laughs> See, he, he come along, he'll do anything. He'll come along, he'll even, he'll even endorse what you're saying just to make you look like you're one of his. It says that he'll come right along, you plant that seed, you sow that seed, and that devil will come right along as quick as he can, and he'll try to suck that up as soon as he can. See, this is why we need to pray. When we go out and share God's word, we need to pray that some hearts would be broken up a little bit. And our heart has to be broken before they can receive God's word. If you've got a hardened heart, that, that seed or that word will just bounce off of them like a, like a ball off a tennis court. But if their hearts begin to be broken, you know, that's why God sometimes has to bring us to a place where our hearts are broken so we can hear from Him. Because if we're doing well, we don't, we don't hear His voice. We don't want to. We don't think we have to. This is the kingdom of God on earth. It says verse 20. But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that hears the word and with joy receives it. See, we've all had this experience. I've had this experience in my life even before I got saved a few times. And I think a lot of us have known people. Man, we tell them about the word of God and they hear the word of God and they say, wow, praise the Lord. They start praising the Lord. I'm always, I'm always cautious. <laughs> And this is, I don't, I don't want to make anybody mad at me. But when somebody first gets saved, 
and they start using all that Christian language? Huh. You know. And they start using it a lot, I start to worry. I start to say, God. Huh. Because they learn, they learn, you know, people learn the outward expression, but sometimes, you know, people say, praise the Lord, amen, praise the Lord, amen, praise the Lord. Three weeks later, man, they don't want to say nothing about it. Why? Because there are those who have, who have the stony ground. Stones and rocks. You know, if you want to plant, plant a garden, you've got to get all them rocks out of there. That's one reason I don't have a garden. I don't feel like digging rocks out in my backyard. He, the same as he that hears with the word and, and with joy receives it. Verse 21. Yet has he no root in himself. You see, it's so important that when we, lead, when we lead somebody to Jesus Christ, we need to begin to start establishing roots in them. We need to start planting the Word of God and praying that that Word will reach down and begin to establish roots. This, this salvation thing about going out, say a prayer, and, and that's it, see you later. No, it has to, it has to establish roots. Just a simple prayer and, you know, say this prayer, repeat after me, and you say, no, it's the Word of God has to, has to go down deep. It says, He has no root in Himself, verse 21. He endures it for a little while, but when tribulation or persecution arises out of the, uh, because, because of the Word, he is offended. You see, people will they'll hear the word, they'll say, Praise the Lord, hallelujah, oh glory to God. You know, and then and somebody like says something to them because they got saved, or somebody like rejects them, or they find themselves being left out of the circle of, of, of people. You know, I, I thought it was amazing. Well, it really didn't I really didn't think this. But a lot of people get saved and they go try to tell all their friends and they expect all their friends to say, Oh, hallelujah. But most of the time, when you get saved, you run with a bunch of wild people, you go tell them you got saved, they'll say, you're nuts. How many people know what I'm talking about? And there's a lot of folks, they receive that word, and they think that the whole world is going to stand up and give them a standing ovation, when most of the world, when they find out if you're really saved, they'll kick you out, and then they'll say, well, I don't know if I want this. How many people know what I'm talking about? How many people have been there? Yeah, you hear that Christian stuff, and you start to, you start to uh, you know, uh, check in on it, and then you find out what, it, what the cost is, and you say, oh, no root. They heard the word. They understood the word. But there was no root. Stony ground. That ground had to be plowed up. Verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of which is choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So here we have a person that receives the word and finds out that the world has all kinds of stuff to offer and that, you know, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross. And people find out what that cross is all about and they say, I'm not sure I want that. So, so look, at, look at what takes the word away. Satan comes and takes the word away. Trouble takes the word away. Good times takes the word away. I mean, there's all different ways that people can lose that when we, when we sow that seed. There's all different ways that people can lose that word. But there's another application to this. I heard a fellow preach one time. Open my eyes. We always use this talking about the lost. But what about in the church? What about in the church? Now I'm talking to saved people. How many people here saved? See, we, we read this and we apply it to spreading the word to lost sinners, and, and again, it's applicable to that. What about us? Let me ask you something, saints, believers, children of God. Born again, sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what, that's what the church God folks say. Saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Has God ever given you a word and you let Satan take it from you? Not, not. Oh, wait a minute, I'm saved. Not, not, listen, don't tell me. Has God ever given you a word 
and you've let Satan snatch that word from you? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about a word from God. God give you a word, and you let your heart get hard. There's something going on, and, and, and you're hard, and, you're, and God gives you a word, and you just brush it off like dandruff off your shoulder. See, Satan, Satan walks along behind us. Well, he does it. He can only be one place at a time. But, you know, he has his, he assigns, just like, you know, we, I believe we have angels, we have guardian angels. Yeah, we have other kind of angels, too. And when God gives you a word, Satan will snatch that word off you if you let him. He'll take that word from you if you let him. Sometimes, we allow ourselves to get shallow. Believers. Followers of Jesus. Sometimes we allow ourselves, we neglect reading, we neglect praying, we neglect fasting, we neglect doing all the things that Jesus told us to do, and we find ourselves getting shallow. And God gives us a word, and we'll get with that word for a little bit, and we'll say, oh, yeah, God gave me a word. But then we find out there's some trouble that comes with it, and we, and we tend to, we just want to, okay. And we let it go. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever let, listen, you ever let yourself get into some stony ground? Get choked out? Sometimes God gives us a word. And the word might be a word of holiness, being set apart. And we hear that word. We say, oh no, Lord, this, oh no, Lord, I'm not ready, I'm not ready for that. Oh no, Lord, peer pressure is too great. Lord, no, I, I just, no, I'm not ready for that. I'm, believers, believers. See, we, like, we always put this to the unbeliever, the ones that we go out and witness to, but see, it's to us too, because God gives us words, and we let those words wither and die sometimes, don't we? Anybody know what I'm talking Come on. Don't, don't tell me I'm the only one that's ever been there. See, God's giving me some words sometimes, and I find myself looking around at what's going around me, and I let that word just, just wither and die. Because I put my eyes on the things of the world, I put my eyes on my circumstances, I put my eyes on my stuff. I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about salvation, I'm talking about living the kingdom life in this world. If God will give you words to help you live this life in a Christless society, and we let Him, we let Him wither and die. It's quiet. But Jesus said, but He that received the seed into the good ground. The good ground. See, good ground. See, Jesus is looking for some good ground to plant seeds. You hear me? I'm talking to, the, this is to the church now, this is to the kingdom. This isn't to the lost in the world. But this is to the church and the kingdom. Jesus is looking for some good ground. What's your ground like? You, 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 you ask yourself that question. Wait, am I ready to receive the word that God has for me? I'm not talking to unbelievers. I'm talking to the church. Are you ready to receive God's word? Because I want to tell you something. This, 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 uh, this year, you know, you would see if it worked. <laughs> it didn't work. Our, our kind of theme for this year is one word. It's the word ready. And somebody asked me, somebody said, they said, ready for what? <laughs> I said, ready for whatever's coming. God didn't tell me what's coming. But things are coming. And when, when we think that word ready, a lot of folks will take that and they'll turn it into like a, you know, get ready for all the good stuff that's coming. <laughs> well... You know, I find myself, I'm, I don't have to get ready for good stuff. I just, when it comes, I'm, just, I'm always ready for something good to happen. How about you? Oh, God bless me. I'm ready for something good to happen. 
But what about the challenges that are coming, that are here? The challenges to our faith. The challenges with our jobs, with our families, with whatever. Are you ready for the challenges? Jesus said, He that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some 100, some 60, some 30. God, help us hear and understand your word. Help us be able to discern your word. Because not every word comes from God. <laughs> oh. See, that's leading me into the next parable. I preached on this just a few months ago. I'll preach on it again. Okay. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now remember, this kingdom of heaven is, is God's kingdom on this earth manifested in the church. Okay? So Jesus isn't back yet. When he comes back, he'll be on the throne in Jerusalem. He'll sit on the throne of David. He'll rule the world. That's what we're promised. But the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. This time we're living in, from the, from the day of Pentecost until now, until Jesus returned, the church age. Okay? He, this man went into his field and he sowed good seed. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. The tares were, were uh, they call, they're called darnel grass. And it's, it's, a, it's a kind of plant that looks just like, uh, just like the wheat that was sowed or the good seed that was sowed that looks the same. And you can't really tell the difference until it comes to fruition. And you can see the fruit of it. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? From whence then has it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. An enemy, well, you mean the enemy is, is at work? Listen, I'll tell you, the enemy is in the church sowing all kinds of tares. All kinds of nonsense is being passed for Christianity right now. The people are going off into all kinds of weird, strange... Listen... If it's not in God's Word, it ain't from God. Just because... Just because it's mystical. See, how many, have, you, have you ever heard the term mysticism? There's such a thing called... Well, they call it Christian mysticism. I would call that term an oxymoron. <laughs> Because while we as believers, I've experienced the presence of God. Have you ever experienced the presence of God? The presence of God is a wonderful thing. I've experienced the presence of God and you get in His presence. Sometimes I'm up here, I'm up here talking. I know whenever I say something that kind of touches a nerve because I feel the presence of God, you know. And that's wonderful. That's great. God is, He's an experiential God. The day of Pentecost, they experienced His presence. We come to church and we pray, God, let us experience. We know you're here, but let us experience your presence. And sometimes he does. Sometimes he manifests himself in, in touching people and, and God moving, and that's, that's great. And sometimes he manifests himself in his word. His word. There's a lot of tares being sown in the church in the United States of America. You might as well say amen. There's a lot of evil being sown in the church. It's been going on for years now. That's why you got, God help me, I'm, I don't hate anybody, please. Please don't accuse me of hating anybody. But that's why we got, we got Pentecostal gay churches. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. You know, Pentecostals, man, they got it together, man. They move in the spirit and talk in tongues and everything. There's, there's you can, I'll, I'm not going to tell you where you can find them, but they're there. <laughs> How can that be? But people, people see that and they say, Oh, look. I 
I'm not going to get off of here. I'm not going to go on. You can, you, can find, you can find so much nonsense. People getting into... The enemy is sowing tears in the church. He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servant said unto him, Will you that we go and gather them up? Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This story, he interprets his own story over there in verse 37. Look at that. He said, He that sows the good seed is who? The Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Read the history. Well, if you read the whole history, it'll take you a long time. But if you start looking at the history of Christianity or Christendom from the day of Pentecost until this day, you will see all kinds of stuff. There's a, I watched a show one time, and the show was dedicated to religious trickery. Okay? And they showed how, and it even went beyond Christianity, even some of the, some of the ancient like, mystery religions. They would devise, they would have devices where they could trick people, and they showed how they could make statues cry. You know, hear statues crying? The pilgrims would come to these churches, these shrines, and they would have these statues. And they would, they would bring these statues up to where, you know, if you gave like five bucks, it would cry. If you gave ten bucks, it would cry blood. I mean, they had, they had it all rigged up, you know. And they had, and they had this, it was, they were really good. And in the name of Jesus, in churches with crosses on them and crucifixes and, you know, Latin and everything. In the name of Jesus. It's been going on. Human beings are ex excellent at trying to figure out how to make money off of anything. Things haven't changed. Man, they're good at making money. Nothing wrong with taking an offering. Got to take an offering. Keep things going. Keep the lights on. Nothing wrong with that. Tithes and offerings, I believe in that. That's worship. You worship God with tithes and offerings. I believe in that. Preach on it when God tells me to do it. I never stand up here and harangue people about money. But, you know, when God says it's time to preach about giving and worship God and you're giving, I preach about that. That's worship. You want to worship God. There's a lot of people who worship God with their hands, but they don't do it with the pocketbook. Blessings. That's right. Promised blessings. There's nothing wrong with taking an offering, and certainly nothing wrong with giving an offering is unto the Lord. You know, we, we, we tell folks, well, we have the money box up there, and we just we have a little sign up there. This is given as unto the Lord. It's worship. But there's something wrong with the whole focus of your ministry, your time, is how much money you can get off the people that's coming. Off the people that are watching. There's evil. There's tears that have been sown. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. All things that offend. Oh, we, we read it last week. Judgment's coming to the house of God. God's going to send his angels to sweep up everything that offends in the church. I'm not talking about out there. I'm talking about it here. We're talking about anything that calls itself the kingdom of God. Judgment's coming. He says, in verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, and he says, who has ears to hear, let him hear. Beloved, do you have ears to hear this morning? Do you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying? Not what I've said. I can't say anything. I can't say it very well. It's what God's Word is speaking to us. We've been talking about two kingdoms. Living in two kingdoms. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. And I'm a part of this world. I'm, I live in this world. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. 
Do I have ears to hear what this word is telling me this morning? See, it's for me too. Do I have ears to hear? Do I, am, I, am I receiving God's word? Or am I letting it lay on the hardened ground? Am I, am I discerning evil in the body of Christ? Mm. It's chilling to think of that, isn't it? See, we have church. People come to church. I thank God people come to church. But my prayer is, when people come to church, I pray they're listening. I pray, I pray you have ears to hear what God is speaking to us. Because in, in, the, in the end of the whole thing, Every one of us is going to stand and give an account. See, I'm sure if I went through this church to each and every individual, and I'm not going to, and if I asked you where you came from before you were saved, and even since you've been saved, because some of you have been saved a long time, some maybe not so long. But if I went through and asked every individual where you came from. You could tell me a long story. You all could. A story of heartache, rejection, sadness, sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when we come to the cross, when we, get, when we stand in front of that cross, see, nobody can stand there for me. When I came to that cross, he, when, when I came to Christ and I, I said, God, if you're real, see, I was, I was, I was, a, I'm a skeptic. I would say I was a skeptic. I'm still a skeptic. I am. It takes a lot to convince me that something's real, especially if it's something I can't see or touch. You know, if you tell me, you know. This pew is real, I can touch it. I say, okay. But spiritual things, I've always been, I've been, show me. So I remember one time I said, God, I said, I, all these people were witnessing to me, and I was listening to this guy and that. And I said, God, and I wanted, I wanted so bad to believe that God was real. Because everything, everything in my life was, was, was just falling apart. And I couldn't find an answer. I tried all them books and stuff. It didn't work. I said, God, if, if you're real. See, and I was all by myself. Says, I was all by myself. There was nobody there with hands on me. There was no, I was all by myself. And you can believe this or not believe it. That's okay. I know it. God touched me. He touched me. See, there was no, I couldn't say, I couldn't say, oh, yeah, man, that, that guy over here was doing some hocus pocus on me, because there was nobody around, it was just me. Because that's what I would say. If I go someplace and that would happen, there would be people around me. You, know you know how we do in church, they have a tearing session sometimes, and people get around, I've seen this, and they'll scream, that's, ah, you know, and, and I mean, that's, uh, you know, some, some places do that, you know, and that's all right, I, that's okay, but, but I was all by myself, and God touched me, and I said, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> and see, from that point on, see, I've always been, and my wife will tell you, I'm a little, I'm still, I'm still, I don't, I don't take anything just because somebody, listen, just because, just because somebody says it's spiritual don't necessarily mean it is. I, if, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing. I, I used to have a pastor named Pastor Willie Spencer. How many people knew P Pastor Spencer? Some of you knew Pastor Spencer. Great man. He passed away back in 98. And we had some tapes. We used to tape his messages all the time. And I found one, an old cassette tape. You remember? How many people remember cassette tapes? Okay. <laughs> and I, so I, I digitized it. Okay. And so I put it on YouTube. If you ever, if you ever go on YouTube, Type in Willie Spencer, and you'll find there's part one and part two because it used to be you couldn't put a whole thing on. 
He preached a message. He preached it 20, over 20 years ago. He preached a message called Deception in the Church. You listen to that message, he could have preached it last night. It was prophetic about what we're seeing. Mm. It was about, I almost want to preach it right now. It was about the fella in 1 Kings, I think it's chapter 13. He was a prophet. God sent this prophet from Judah to the northern kingdom to warn the king that he was into idolatry. And if you remember the story, the king's name was Jeroboam. And uh, the prophet came, and the king was going to have him killed, and the prophet pointed his finger, and he was stricken with leprosy. I mean, yeah, anybody remember that story, hear that story? It's in 1 Kings chapter 13, you want to read it. And anyway, uh, the guy asked forgiveness, Jeroboam, the king asked forgiveness, and, and the prophet spoke, and this leprosy went away. So the king said, hey, come on, let me, let me give you lunch. And the prophet said, God told me to go back, and not take any food or water off you just to get right back home. So he, the guy started back to Judah, and on the way back to Judah, there was, a, there was a, an old prophet that came up and met him and said, hey, come on, come on over for lunch. And the guy said, oh, no. He said, uh, God told me I had to get right back, right back to uh, uh, Jerusalem. And the guy said, well, you know what? I'm a prophet, and, some, and an angel came to me and told me that you're supposed to come with me. Oh, yeah. Read the story. The guy lost his life because he was not obedient to God. God is calling a people to obedience today. To obedience to His Word. That Word that He's given you. Some of us have let it bounce off the hardened ground. Some of us have let it uh, just wallow in shallow ground. Some of us have let it get, uh, get seared and, and withered away. But listen, I want to tell you something. God has a Word for you today. He wants you to plant it in fallow ground. And He wants that, that Word to grow and bring forth much fruit in your life. He's speaking today to all of us. Will we listen? Will we hear? I want to pray this morning. Let me ask you this. And where you're at. How many have heard God's word this morning? Have you heard God's word? This, have you heard him speak this morning? Has he, has, has he said anything to you? Not, not me, please. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm just reading. If God's word has spoken to you this morning, in whatever situation... Could we all just come and pray together? Won't you come? I'm going to ask Joe to maybe come and strum a little bit and sing something. Just, we just want to come and maybe join hands and pray one for another. If you've heard God's word this morning, I'm not going to lay hands on folks. We just want to join hands and pray. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. You've heard God's word this morning. It's not my word. You've heard God's word. So if you could play, come Lord Jesus, all who are thirsty, all who are weak. Joe plays this song. We're going to sing. We're going to believe God. Hallelujah.